It's time for the Georgia State Sports Update. Dave Cohen in studio this week on the Georgia State Sports Update with Brandon Leak. He joins me on the radio as color commentator. We're just back from New Orleans, Georgia State, unfortunately, a first-round exit in the Sunbelt Conference Tournament, a loss 63-61 to the Bobcats of Texas State. Not what we were looking for or hoping for heading uh, to the Crescent City of New Orleans, but it is what it is, and the Panthers end up finishing the season branded at 16-14 and 14 this year. Yeah, certainly something we're not used to, being home early and not playing on Sunday, but uh, Coach Ron Hunter and his coaching staff did a phenomenal job this year. There was a lot of turnover and change and uh, a lot of continuity that needed to be worked out and I think the guys are going to be better for next season going through some of the trials and tribulations they, they had to go through this year. Again, uh, the team last year, of course, wins 25. They beat Baylor in the NCAA tournament after winning the Sun Belt Conference tournament. It was, for Georgia State basketball, a little bit of an adjustment. Life after R.J. Hunter, life after Ryan Harrow and Curtis Washington and Ryan Green, a couple of new faces. Uh, but, you know, a, a big loss off of last year's team. Before the Panthers even took the floor this year, uh, with the loss of uh, R.J. and Ryan, there were 40 points right off the uh, scoreboard. Right, and there were 40 points. Either they scored by making field goals or they could make free throws and find a way to get to their 40 points. Uh, it was a, an interesting ride. You had a really good defensive team all season long. Uh, the Panthers uh, did so well in their coverages and learning because Coach Hunter's defense is a, is a bit complex, and a lot of guys who didn't expect to play the minutes that they played got a chance to play, and it was just unfortunate that that the offense could not match what the defense was able to do. And I think that certainly will be a priority. We averaged around 65 points per game. And if we averaged probably 68 or 70, we probably would have had closer to 20 wins this season. So it was an adjustment period. But I think the guys who got a chance to play, I think that was the win for the Panthers because a lot of guys who weren't slated to get minutes got those minutes this season. I think going into the season, too, a lot of Panthers fans just looked at it and said, okay, well, Ryan Harrell's not here and R.J. Hunter's not here, but Kevin Ware's back after playing so well and really leading us to that win uh, in the Sun Belt Tournament last year. And Jeremy Hollowell, who transferred in from Indiana University, who we had heard a lot about and had a chance to see in practice. I think a lot of people just assumed that those two would kind of become and fill the shoes uh, of, of Hunter and Harrow, which, you know, um, some nights they did, but many nights they weren't able to do that. Well, you just can't assume chemistry. The guys right. have to get out there, and they did well. They, they pretty much played to their strengths and played their roles. Uh, Jeremy Hollowell was supposed to lead us in scoring. He did. Kevin Ware was supposed to be the number two option. He was. And so those guys had to work things out. When teams started double-teaming Jeremy, it was the first time he had to play with guys taking his strengths away from him. And so something R.J. Hunter had to learn last year, a professional player this year, uh, when teams double-teamed him, his game had to change a little bit. And so it just takes time. You can't just throw people together and say, oh, it's going to be a championship and it's going to be that easy. What we learned, I think, most from the season is that it is hard to win championships and they should be cherished when they are earned on the court. And even though Jeremy Hollowell and Kevin Ware led the way offensively most nights in scoring, it, it became a recurrent theme, almost, uh, you know, like sounded like a broken record on some of our radio postgame shows, looking for the third score, somebody to step up on a consistent basis and join those two. Uh, because, you know, for most of the year, we were dead last in the Sun Belt Conference in points per game at right around 65 points. And we found him at times. Most of the time, it was Isaiah Williams who did a very good job. Remember, when he started the season, he was going to be the point guard. And so in the mid part of the season, we had to move him over to the shooting guard. And so we had to tinker with the point guard situation. We saw his point production start to go up towards the end of the season, uh, which was a positive sign. But uh, again, a guy had to have a role shift. He had to go through uh, some chemistry changes with his teammates. And then we had to deal with a point guard situation, which was changing. I mean, we saw Isaiah Dennis. We saw Austin Donaldson. Uh, we saw Kevin Ware run the the point guard so uh, there were a lot of changes and, and 
Hopefully next year, Isaiah will be better for it. Jeremy will be better for it. And our point guard situation will be uh, outlined a little bit earlier in the season. Again, as you said to Austin Donaldson, coming on late, able to get uh, some valuable minutes. But I think fans, again, who have followed the program have gotten used to seeing Devontae White for four years, <laughs> followed by Ryan Harrow for two years. I mean, it kind of got spoiled a little bit with some really solid point guard play. Yeah, when you put it up 70 <laughs> points and 80 <laughs> points, when you don't even have to think about it, it does get uh, a a little spoiling to, to the crowd and to us. I mean, how many games that we call yeah. uh, when we would be up 15 and we make it 20 or we'd be down 20 and come back and win the game because you just had uh, such an array of firepower. So now in switching, there are going to be some role changes. Hopefully Jeff Thomas, another freshman who got some minutes, will get a chance to knock down some three pointers. He also showed the ability to go inside, showed some up and under moves at times, uh, helped to get some rebounds. He can help fill that role and help get the numbers closer to 70 and 75 than 65 next season. The other difference, too, in this year's team with Marcus Kreider and T.J. Scheibs back, the loss of Curtis Washington, really not that 6'9", 6'10", post presence. And even though Kurt many nights would be scoring, what, five, six, seven points a game, he was still a solid low post presence that opposing teams had to be aware of when working in and around the basket. We didn't have that this yeah, year. Yeah, and, and there were different players. T.J. Shipes yeah. and Marcus Kreider are all-timers. They're all-time Panther greats, have done a great job of being part of the championship run, you know, really helping to uh, rebuild the name of Georgia State. And both of those guys were solid players. T.J., probably the toughest guy on the team, took more charges than anybody. And Marcus, a smart player who was good on both ends of the floor, uh, but they they were a combination. They did different things together on the floor. And so next year with Willie Clayton coming in, it'll be interesting to see what he brings because he's a big, strong, physical body, and he should be able to help us not only with rebounding, but probably offensive rebounding, which could help us get our scores to where we want them to be. So again, 63-61, the final score in uh, New Orleans at Lakefront Arena. Let's touch on that game real quick because it really was a game of two halves. Up by 13 at halftime, 34-21 uh, after shooting, what, almost 52% from the floor in the first half. Go in the locker room, come out, totally different ball club, or somewhat totally different ball club. We end up shooting 39%, get outscored 42-27 in the second half. You hear them all the, t all the time, coaches say, well, we made adjustments. Yeah, it's a lot of coach speak, but whatever they did in the locker room, changing up their, uh, you know, scheme defensively did affect us. Well, and they came out and made shots, and, and yeah. that's the bottom line. You know, defense is certainly wonderful. You're going to need defense if you want to be a championship team. We've seen that over the past two seasons, but also you have to score, and the team that scores the most points wins, and I think the, the turning point in that game was early in the second half. We were up 13. I believe uh, Texas State hit their first three shots. One of them was a three-pointer. Yeah. We missed our first first three spot, uh, shots. And so within a matter of minutes, half of that 13 point lead had been evaporated. And so now it changes the point of the game. And uh, it was just one of those deals where uh, we could not find a way to get one or two buckets or two or three free throws to kind of stop the comeback run Texas State was trying to make. Yeah, you talk about uh, looking at statistics. They shoot 15 of 23 in that second half, 65%. They go from 36 to 65%, as you said, made their first three shots in the second half. And we struggled in the second half, 9 out of 23 uh, in losing a close ball game. Uh, you know, a couple of plays down the stretch here and there uh, could have made the difference in the ball game. I always go back, uh, at least the one that stuck with me was the Isaiah Williams as he tried to throw that ball off the defender's uh, leg. And uh, they go back and review it. It ends up belonging in Texas State. They hit a three out of that uh, out of that shot. Yeah, and, and the three point ball was something that really helped uh, Texas State. They hit most of their three pointers in the second half of play. Uh, Georgia State, one of the top perimeter uh, defensive teams in the country throughout most of the season. But when you get into tournament time, one or two shots can make the difference. Certainly, five or six can make a difference. And so they hit the majority of their three point shots uh, late in the second half, including including the dagger with two and a half seconds left to play. All right, so as it turns out, Little Rock, the champion of the Sunbelt Conference Tournament, they end up beating Louisiana Monroe uh, last Sunday to win the championship. And if you looked at the bracket, which I have right here in front of me, it kind of 
progressed the way I think everybody thought it would. The higher seeds got to the finals, and uh, the higher seed, the, the ultimate number one seed, uh, ended up winning it. And they were deserving. Yeah. Uh, we had those guys, in my opinion. We had them both times. We had them in Arkansas. We had a good shot here at the GSU Sports Arena. Uh, but in both games with five minutes to go, uh, I can't remember what the stats were, but it, I think in Arkansas, we were 0 for our last eight from the floor. And then here, I think it was some something similar where we were two for our last ten. So playing great defensive basketball had us in position to win, but we couldn't close the deal offensively at the end of the game. And I think that's something else to be learned going into next year, how to close teams out when you have them on the ropes. That's something that could uh, could have changed the course of this season, certainly, and given us maybe a buy or a double buy had we taken care of some business earlier in the season. So again, Arkansas Little Rock wins the Sunbelt Conference Tournament in New Orleans. They're going to advance to the NCAA Tournament. They're going to take on the Boilermakers of Purdue. Uh, so they're the only team that ends up in the uh, in the uh, NCAA tournament out of the Sun Belt Conference. Real quick, women's basketball: Sharon Baldwin, Tenors Crew, ten and nineteen overall, five and fifteen of the Sun Belt. They did not advance to the Sun Belt Conference tournament. They're back in a rebuilding mode right now. Yeah, it was tough for Coach Baldwin, Tenors. She had uh, so many pieces in and out of the lineup, key pieces. And then we talked about that chemistry. Even though you get your pieces back, it doesn't mean automatically you're going <clears> to <throat> lead the Sun Belt in three point percentage and you're going to just take over. You know, she had has a lot of freshmen uh, that came in and got a lot of playing minutes, but I think uh, the future is bright. When you look at Madison Newby, she's a, a player that can finish at the rack. Uh, Astasia Titer is one of those players that is a, a gamer and understands and has a good feel uh, for the game. And then one of the freshmen, K.K. Williams, coming off the bench, one of those long and lanky athletic players, um, they're going to be fun to watch. And uh, getting all those freshmen in, they're going to be able to grow up and be sophomores, juniors, and seniors together. And I think the Panthers are going to be some team uh, you're going to have to watch out for in years to come. All right, Brandon, appreciate you coming in, and uh, we'll be right back on the radio before you know it uh, on, the, on the road with basketball again soon. It's funny. The older you get, the <coughs> quicker it comes. I look yeah. forward to it. Thanks for having me, Dave. All right. want to thank Brandon Lee coming in and joining us. He and I on the radio all year with uh, Georgia State basketball. Busy time right now uh, here at Georgia State Athletically. Time now to take a look at what's coming up this week in Georgia State Athletics. This week in Georgia State Athletics on Saturday, March the 26th, it's an all-day event, Beach Volleyball hosting the GSU Sand Slam at the GSU Sand Courts. That's located right behind the Georgia State Sports Arena downtown. On Sunday, March 27th, Monday, March 28th, and Tuesday, March 29th, Women's Golf hosting the John Kirk Panther Intercollegiate out at Eagles Landing in Stockbridge, Georgia. On Wednesday, March 30th, Georgia State Baseball on the road to Macon to take on Mercer. That'll be a 6 o'clock p.m. first pitch. On Thursday, March 31st at 12 noon, women's tennis taking on the Warhawks of Louisiana Monroe at Piedmont Park. And on Friday, April the 1st, baseball against UT Arlington at the GSU Baseball Complex out at Panthersville. First pitch at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And that's what's going on this week in Georgia State Athletics. Well, if you've been to a Georgia State men's or women's basketball game, a football game at the Georgia Dome, no doubt you've seen the cheerleaders, you've seen the dance team, you've seen the mascot, Pounce. Who coordinates all that? Well, our Cali man caught up with the director of spirit squads within Georgia State Athletics, and that's Daryl Lyons. So what are you in charge of at Georgia State? What is your role here? I am in charge of... I guess building and maintaining the spirit of the university, of, of all of our athletic events, which would include leading the cheerleaders, coaching the cheerleaders, heading up the dance team, and also managing the mascots. So we got the cheerleaders, we got the dance team, and we got the mascot. Correct. How do all three of those work together to bring spirit to Georgia State? Starting with the cheerleaders, of course the cheerleaders lead the crowd, they do the cheers, they have the signs that you know, to tell people what to say, say GSU or whatever. They are there to lead and just to create that spirited atmosphere. The dance team is there to also lead the crowd, but in a different way. They are there to entertain the crowd. So like when the band plays, they um, do little quick dances and stuff like that. And of course, like at halftime of the basketball games, they are the show. Oh. And then Pounce, of course, is there to lead, the crowd, entertain the crowd, all three pretty much in one because he is the ambassador that's walking through the crowd, 
taking pictures with the little kids, you know, just entertaining people. He'll sometimes pull out signs and say, you know, say G, say S, just say you, you know. He does his in a different way because, of course, as a mascot, he can't speak. So he definitely has to get your attention with a sign or with gestures or something like that. Basically, all three of those components working together create the really exciting atmosphere that we have in the, in the, in the arena. I mean, what do you teach the cheerleaders? Right. What do you teach the dance team? What are some of the values you instill in them to make sure that they go out, they give it their all at all of these events? The values that we instill in the teams or in the, in the athletes are confidence, uh, commitment, resilience, teamwork, mm -hmm. dedication. Because those five things will make them successful adults when they, when they leave college. Those are things that we have to have daily to be successful as a team. I mean, if you're, you know, with the co-ed team, if your girl is feeling like she's not wanting to work as hard that day or she's feeling a little ill or whatever and the guy is really motivated, they've got to come together and be motivated together on the same page so that their stunts will hit. Because with a co-ed team, you've got one guy with one girl on top of him. And if something's wrong or if there's a bad chemistry imbalance, then the girl could fall or, or the guy could stumble and he could get hurt or whatever. So it's really, really important for everybody, everyone to be on the same page and to be dedicated and to be committed and to be ready, you know, for what they have to do each day because it can be dangerous if they aren't. Oh, yeah. I fear for them sometimes. Right, I'm like, right. just because I can't do it, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> right. So tell us, I mean, there's so many things that go on at a basketball game. I mean, you have the beginning of the game, the intro, you have halftime, free throws. How do the cheerleaders and the dance team and Pounce know what they're supposed to do at that time? Like, oh, it's time to go to the free throw line. How do they know what cheers to say and when to put their pom-poms up and things right. like that? Well, a lot of those things we've done for years. I mean, they're just tradition, but we obviously go over those things in practice. I mean, practice, practice, practice. I mean, just like in any other sport or activity, at every practice, I mean, we warm up, stretch out, warm up all of the skills that we're gonna do, you warm up your standing tumbling like you're saying for free throws, and then we go over everything that you're gonna do in a game. We go over how to enter, where to go on the floor, what your formation is, what you're gonna do when you get to the formation. So all of those things are clear. You know, the night before or two nights before, we'll, we'll go over that for a couple hours and, and practice that stuff. And then of course, before the game, we're upstairs on sixth floor going over it again to make sure that everybody's on the same page so when we go out there, we don't, you know, we don't wanna, Look crazy, basically. <laughs> so what about the pet band? I know that you guys are two separate entities, but when it's game time, it seems like you guys work together. Yes, we have a great relationship with the pet band. Um, Chester and I have been here the same amount of time. We both came in uh, during the years of the beginning of football. And my philosophy, coming from Arkansas, at the University of Arkansas, our band and our cheerleaders, the dance team, the entire spirit program works together to entertain and lead the crowd. Your band is your microphone. They accelerate everything that we're doing. So they're gonna back us up, not only just cheering like in the, in the arena, they're great at cheering with us, like doing the sideline chants and stuff like that, but also every song that the band plays, most every song that the band plays, like all the spirit songs, we have choreographed things that go along with it. Words, voiceover, signs, dances, whatever, you know, stunts, whatever it takes to get the crowd excited. Right. So all of that works together. You've got your dancers that are there to enter entertain at halftime and during the game, the cheerleaders are leading, and then the band, of course, has given us the backup with the music. So it just makes the atmosphere amazing in there. I mean, when, when we've got all of those seats filled and everybody's ready and, and the Panthers are on the court, it's, it's exciting. It's yeah. really, really amazing. And it is very exciting, and the girls are always excited and into it. And I've always wondered, there's a, they have to have a sense of Panther pride in themselves. Absolutely. You have to have pride in your school. You have to enjoy sports and athletics. Because, I mean, we've had in the past, we've had cheerleaders that are like, oh, I really don't like, you know, guys and girls, oh, I really don't like football or I don't like basketball. But when you become a part of the program and you're there at every game, it, it, it builds up in you. It, it, you just kind of, you can't stop it from, you can't stop becoming, you know, a Panther proud person.
you know, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> I mean, because we're at every event, you know, I mean, we go to not only the games, but we're at, you know, philanthropic type things to, uh, to get people engaged and get people excited about Georgia State because now they're a part of our family. So all of that stuff that you do, going to camp in the summer and going to all the football games and going to events where you're with the president speaking or with little kids, entertaining, stuff like that, all of that builds your Panther pride. So when it comes down to it, you know, at games and pep rallies and performances and stuff, I think at that point, you know, if you didn't have it, you got it because you're smiling, you're excited, and you're ready for us to win. What happens after we make a free throw? As our tradition here at, at Georgia State, it's, it happens at other schools as well, but um, after free throws, if our team is on this side of the court, which is the same side of the court with the cheerleaders, the cheerleaders go GSU and they throw their palm up and the guys catch it with the megaphone. And I think we saw this at our Sun Belt tournament last year and we thought, oh, that's kind of cool, let's do that. So we kind of adapted that uh, this year. Sometimes at, at timeouts, um, like if we have a quick timeout and we don't have something planned, we spontaneously, um, some of the members tumble across the floor. And this is obviously a, a big crowd favorite. Um, most of the kids, I'd say 80% of the kids on the team, in, in the program, have tumbling, running tumbling, standing tumbling, because that's a basic requirement. So tell us a little bit about Pounce. What is Pounce all about? He's the image, he's the brand, he's the silent spirit of Georgia State. We have four young men that work in and out of the suit. Those guys remain nameless because it's as tradition, you want that mystique of Pounce to be that mystique. You want it to be a mystery. So we do not let people know who Pounce is, but a lot of times people can kind of tell, I guess you can say. But we try as, as much as possible to keep that tradition alive of keeping it silent and, and secret. Bounce's mystique, though, or his purpose, like I said before, is to entertain and to interact and just give it that college feel of that's the animal that represents Georgia State. Sometimes he may have the signs to work the crowd. Sometimes, you know, if a good song is on and that particular bounce likes that song, he's gonna he's gonna break it down for him. I mean, you know, he's gonna he's gonna do it. So so it's really really exciting, really fun. I mean, he just adds that an extra spark of entertainment to the whole spear program. All right, thanks, Callie. And right now we're back in studio here in the Georgia State Sports Update, and we're talking soccer, joined right now by Ed Joyce. He's the brand new, and I do underline the word, words brand new, soccer coach here uh, for the women's soccer team here at Georgia State. Great to have you here in studio. And uh, you're new, but you're not new to Georgia State. You're back here after being an assistant. Uh, well, you were an assistant at Campbell University up in lovely Boys Creek, North Carolina, but you were assistant here at Georgia State prior uh, with the men's soccer team. Talk a little bit about your desire to come back and, you know, moving from uh, men's soccer over to women's soccer here at Georgia State. I mean, I had uh, four great years here uh, working with, you know, Coach Sorensen, and we had, you know, some of my fond men memories in coaching our here. Um, obviously, making into the tournament as an at-large bid was huge for for the program and, you know, kind of went in line with the goals that we have for the, for the women's program moving forward. Um, the opportunity to come back, Obviously, work at a place you love and a lot of places you have you know, a lot of respect for what they do here was, was huge for me. Um, moving from the men's to the women's is kind of a, another move back because I coached uh, women at Ohio University for a year uh, while I was doing my, my graduate degree. So it's a big, uh, big cycle for me, it seems. So is the traffic the same in Boyce Creek as it is here <laughs> in Atlanta? Uh, there's cars in both places. Uh, I think the, the number of which changes uh, dramatically coming back to Atlanta for sure. So coming back to Atlanta, you come in and you take over a team that went 11, six and four last year, advanced to the Sun Belt Conference Championship, ultimately losing to South Alabama, but it, it allows you to come in and kind of hit the ground running a little bit, doesn't it? It does, we've got uh, a lot of players who have ex seen ex the experience of winning and have seen success. Uh, obviously we lost quite a few players in the fall, so this, the spring group is, is very young, but I think they're excited by the finish they had in the fall. And I think they're very hungry to hopefully uh, repeat that success in the coming fall. And Georgia State's women's soccer team finishing ranked 10th in the uh, NCSAA South region. So you've come back, you've already got a competitive team, and you've got 16 letter winners returning. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the girls that will, uh, you know, participate in this team next We do. Year. I mean, we, uh, we return a piece that you know, didn't play a whole lot last year in, uh, in our goalkeeper, Bree Haynes, um, to be a redshirt junior this coming year, coming off the back of a, uh, a medical redshirt. Um, she's a very long goalkeeper, got good size. You know, she's a good shot stopper and really kind of gives us a bit of a base to build upon at the back. 
Uh, so excited to have her return. She's having a great spring so far. Um, and obviously, you know, you're talking about you know Suzanne as well coming from an, an all-region uh, type year. Uh, and being a senior, we'll be expecting a lot from her on both both sides of the ball and in a leadership perspective. Yeah, when you talk about leadership in soccer, it's it's got to come from the seniors, maybe a little bit of the juniors, the folks that have been on the program. Uh, and 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 you've got a group of girls now that have got to get used to your style of coaching. What would you, how would you describe your style of coaching, maybe compared to what was here, if you're familiar with what was here? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, Derek and Mallory did a great job. You know, I think every coach is, is slightly different. Um, I've always described myself as not a screamer. You know, I think pretty even keeled, but you know, I think a lot of teaching moments happen you know, in the training environment, and then hopefully it <laughs> transfers into the games. But uh, no, it's been good. I've been putting a lot of onus and a lot of, a lot of pressure on them to make decisions on the ball and to really kind of become a little bit more uh, intelligent players um, through the training process. Well, you mentioned training process. You were just telling me uh, you guys just came off a, a schedule of training and practice. Mm -hmm. How did that go? And anybody kind of stand out uh, during the four days? It went really well. I mean, it's just hard to pick anybody out, you know, to be honest. I mean, they, uh, they kind of bought into to what I want to do, which is a, maybe slightly different. Uh, like I said, then everybody's a little bit different. Uh, it's a bit different, so they've bought in, they've worked really hard, and, uh, you know, they've gone on spring break now, so hopefully they come back with, a, with the same attitude come Monday. All right, again, I know you've only been here, what, just going on your second week, uh, <laughs> and they've already been playing a little bit of a spring schedule, which includes a game against Alabama, a soccer match against Georgia. Uh, they lost to Alabama and they tied Georgia, which I know you said you had a chance to see. What do you see when you when you watch this uh, team? You know, early on in your first week here, I saw a lot of positives. The main one, we mm -hmm. went one nil down early against Georgia. Um, you know, and against you know the mighty Georgia, it's easy to uh, you know to go into a shell at that point. And they didn't. They fought back and got the equaliser. Ended up you know one all. So I think resilience is what, is what I've seen in those, in especially in the first performance. Um, Alabama came off the back of only three days rest, so I think with a small squad that we have this spring, it wasn't a, you know, really a fair indication of, of the ability, but they still fought well to the end. I always like to ask coaches your, your philosophy in scheduling. Uh, <laughs> most of them say, you know, they like balanced schedule. Mm -hmm. You don't want to overload with too many of the Power Five conference teams. And, you know, you kind of want to balance it out so you get a, get a good look at what your team's capable of. What's your philosophy, what's your philosophy in, in scheduling? I think it's very similar. I think coming from uh, the men's program here at Georgia State, we've never, we never shied away from playing anybody. You know, I think that's going to be the same philosophy here. But I think you're correct in that, you know, you need to have a balance both home and away and, you know, Power Five versus, you know, both local games where you know, we've got a lot of these girls have friends at Mercer and Kennesaw that it's important that right. we, we keep those rivalry games going. And how's the Sun Belt stacking up for the coming years? We mentioned uh, Georgia State's women's soccer team lost to South Alabama in the championship game last year. Quick synopsis on the Sun Belt when it comes to women's soccer. Yes. And I know, again, I know you haven't been here that long, but just what you've seen from the outside looking in. I came off the back of a lot of research on Saturday. Um, <laughs> But looking at looking at it, I mean, it's a it's a strong, tough to bottom conference. There's a lot of travel. Um, you know, it's a lot of equalizers. So it comes down to, I think, y your home games are massively important. And then when you travel, you've got to you know do the best you can to steal points where you can. Well, coach, great having you in studio today. Welcome back to Atlanta. Welcome back to Georgia State, and uh, best of luck with the women's soccer team here. Thanks very much. All right, I want to thank Ed Joyce. He is uh, returning to Georgia State. He's the new women's soccer coach here. Uh, for Georgia State University. So that'll wrap it up for this week's show. Want to thank the entire crew, Brandon Leak, for joining us earlier in the show. And for Coach Joyce, I'm Dave Cohen. We'll see you here next week on the Georgia State Sports Update.